Hi guys, here is the video going over section 1.4 functions. After you are done watching this video, you should be able to use function notation as well as find the domain of a function. So the first slide has just your definitions. Domain is your set of inputs, also known as x. Your range is your set of outputs, also known as y or f of x. A function is a correspondence that assigns each x to exactly one y. So now applying that definition to an actual example, we want to determine whether this table and this graph represent a function. So again, going back to the definition, the definition says that each x has only one y. So each x should have a unique y. If I look at my table, I have an x of 2, which goes to 11, as well as another x of 2, which goes to 10. So this right here, my 2's do not have a unique y. My 2 is going to both 10 and 11. So for letter A, this is not a function. For letter B, anytime you're given a graph, the graphs you should use something called a vertical line test. A vertical line test uses vertical lines. So I'm gonna draw vertical lines that go through my points and I want to make sure that my vertical lines do not cross more than one point. So I only have one point on each vertical line. If that is the case, then yes, it represents a function. So I'm gonna write, this is a function. Now let me draw a graph that would represent something that is not a function, so something that would fail the vertical line test. So here's your x and y axis. Let's say you have a graph that looks like this. And I try my vertical line test, so vertical line right there. You'll notice that my vertical line touches in two spots. So this graph right here is not a function. So, so again, the vertical line test will determine whether or not your graph is a function. The next thing we're going to look at is equations and determining whether or not our equations represent functions. In order to do that, you are going to take each equation and solve for y. So for my first equation to solve for y, I'm going to start by subtracting x squared from both sides. That gives me y equals negative x squared plus 1. Now before I tell you whether or not this is a function, I want to solve letter D as well. So at letter D, I'm going to get my y squared by itself. I'm going to start by adding x to both sides. So I have y squared equals x plus 1. Now I'm going to ask myself, how do I undo a square? Because I'm trying to get that y by itself. And that is by taking the square root. So I'm going to square root both sides, and that equals y equals square root of x plus 1. Now, anytime you do take the square root of both sides when you're solving an equation, there's always a plus or a minus involved, because technically it could be the positive square root of x plus 1, or it could also be the negative square root of x plus 1. So let's talk about letter D before I tell you whether C is a function or not. So let me give you an example using letter D. Let's say x is 2. Now ah, let's not go with 2, let's go with 3. Works out nicer. <laughs> so if x is 3 and I plug it in, I get y equals plus or minus the square root of 3 plus 1, which gives me plus or minus the square root of 4, which is positive or negative 2. So what, what happens here is this 3 is going to go to both a positive 2 and a negative 2. And if I look back at my table, my 2's went to both an 11 and a 10, which made it not a function. So this 3 is going to both a 2 and a negative 2, which makes this not a function because of that plus or minus. That plus or minus is going to create two y values for every single x value. Now going back to letter C, letter C does not have a plus or minus. So every single time I put in a value in for this x, it's going to come out with just one y. So letter C is a function. It's a function. So again, letter D is not a function because of the plus or minus, and letter C is a function because every value of x that you put in is only going to come out with one y value as the answer.
this slide is just telling you um, sign, or function notation. So x is our input. Our output is f of x in terms of function notation. We did talk about your output also being y, but that's typically used for equations like you see right here. Um, function notation can be represented several different ways. So for each one of these, it's stating the same type of function. So I have f of x equals 1 minus x squared. What that means is, is I'm taking 1 minus whatever my input is and squaring it. So whatever is in this parenthesis, that is your input. Um, it can be an x, it could be a t, it could be an s, it could even be a triangle. So I want you to think of your function as a sort of machine. So you're going to take whatever is in the parenthesis, that's your input. This right here represents your function machine, so that's the operations that your functions are working with. And then you're going to have a corresponding output after your input goes through that function machine. The reason why I wrote this four times is because you can see function notation several different ways, but as you can see, every single one of these functions does the same type of operation, one minus your input squared. Okay, so now let's actually work with function notation. So for the first one, I have g of x equals 10 minus 3x squared. I want to find each function value. So I want to find g of 2. So if I look at my function, there's my input. Whatever my input is, is going to be placed over here. So in this case, my input is a 2. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in 2 for x. When I do that, that gives me 10 minus 3 times 4, which is 10 minus 12, or negative 2. I'm going to do the same thing for letter B. My input is a negative 4, so I have 10 minus 3 times 4 squared. So that is 10 minus 3 times 16. 10 minus 3 times 16 is 48. So that gives me negative 38. So when your input is a number, it's pretty simple, just plug it in for that variable. Sometimes your input is not a number, sometimes it is an expression, like for the letter C where I have x minus 1. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the same thing. So I have 10 minus 3, and where I see that x, I'm going to put x minus 1 squared. Now that x minus 1 squared, I'm going to work it out along the side. x minus 1 squared is equal to x minus 1 times another x minus 1. So you need to actually multiply it out. So that gives me x squared minus 1x, just distributing, minus another x plus 1, combining like terms, and I get x squared minus 2x plus 1. So I'm going to go ahead and continue simplifying. So I have negative 10 minus 3 times x squared minus 2x plus 1. I'm going to distribute. Now when I do distribute, I'm going to distribute both the 3 and the negative because um, I don't like to really deal with the subtraction. So negative 3 times x squared is negative 3x squared. Negative 3 times negative 2x is positive 6x. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3. And finally, combining like terms, please write it in descending order from highest exponent down. So I have negative 3x squared plus 6x. And of course, I can combine these like terms, 10 minus 3, which is 7. All right, so that is dealing with function notation. The next thing we're going to look at is domain. So the domain is a set of all real numbers for which the expression is defined. I did define domain on the first slide as your set of x values. When we're talking about domain in terms of a function, it's your possible x values um, that actually work for the function, so for which it is defined. So you have a couple issues with domain. Um, you can't have so for rationals, you can't divide by zero, and for radicals, you can't take the square roots of negative numbers. So rational expressions are something like this, f of x equals 1 over x. And since we cannot divide by zero, that puts limitations on what your x's can be, since you can't divide by zero. And then for radicals, here's an example of a radical, so f of x equals the square root of x.
For radicals, you can't take the square roots of negative numbers because those are imaginary. Those are not real. So again, that puts limitations on what your x is um, since you cannot take the square roots of negative numbers. So let's actually work with this for a couple of problems. So find the domain of each function. So letter A is one of your rational expressions. So I'm going to make a note. It's a rational expression. And again, for rational expressions, you can never divide by 0. So that means these two denominators can never be 0. So I'm going to say x plus 5 cannot equal 0, and x minus 2 cannot equal 0. And I'm going to solve both of these equations. So that means x cannot be negative 5, and x cannot be positive 2. So when I'm writing out my domain, I'm just going to say x cannot be negative 5 or 2. So that means for every value of x, you can plug it into your function and it would work except when your x is negative 5 and your x is 2 because those would result in zeros in the denominator, which you can't have. For letter B, I have v of r equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now if I look at this, it is not a rational expression. I don't have a fraction where my variable is in the denominator. And it's also not a radical, which means for this particular function, your domain can really be anything. So for my domain, I can really plug in anything for this r. It could be a fraction, it could be a decimal, it could be a positive number or a negative number. So my domain for this is going to be all real numbers. Now all real numbers, you have that symbol r with a line through it, or if you wanted to use interval notation, that is negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, and the last one, h of x is equal to the square root of 4 minus 3x. So uh, again, this one has an issue because it is a radical. And with radicals, you can only take the square roots of positive numbers. So that means that 4 minus 3x has to be positive. Well, positive numbers are greater than 0. Negative numbers are less than 0, so I want my 4 minus 3x to be greater than 0. Now for this particular example, I can actually equal 0 because I am allowed to take the square root of 0. Square root of 0 is 0. So for this, I'm going to go ahead and solve the inequality. I'm going to subtract 4 from both sides. That gives me negative 3x is greater than or equal to negative 4. Divide both sides by negative 3. And then for my inequality, since I'm dividing by a negative, that is going to flip the sign it's just an inequality rule. So I have x is less than or equal to a positive 4 thirds. So your domain is going to be x is less than or equal to positive 4 thirds as an inequality or as an interval since it's less than or equal to that is going to be from negative infinity up to 4 thirds parentheses around the infinity bracket around the four-thirds because of the or equal to. Alright, so that concludes this lesson on section 1.4.